Now, I want to announce the talk of uh, uh, Guillaume de Legre. He talks about reverse engineering a Qualcomm baseband. And uh, the question and answer session is at the end of the talk. So please give a round of applause to Guillaume. Hello, everyone. So yeah, uh, the topic of this talk is about uh, reverse engineering uh, basebands, and uh, especially in this case, uh, Qualcomm models. So, um, well, just a few, uh, a little intro about uh, baseband, the baseband world. Uh, well, for people who don't know what baseband is, uh, well, the baseband the processor is, uh, well. Please go near to the microphone. Please okay. So it's the main uh, chipset of your phone, uh, responsible for uh, handling uh, telecommunications and uh, uh, everything uh, over the air. It's interface to hardware and it handles uh, the protocol stacks for the telephony protocols. So, uh, well, uh, most of the time, uh, well, a lot of people have a, have a smartphone, which is uh, capable of running uh, a separate operating system like. Uh, Windows Mobile, uh, Android, iOS, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, the baseband, the baseband operating system is uh, most of the time, are, well, it's always hidden. Uh, you don't directly interact with it. You don't have the the end on it. So, well, the, the biggest uh, suppliers for of, uh, of Qualcomm uh, of uh, baseband chips are well, the leader I think is uh, Qualcomm, uh, followed by uh, MediaTek and uh, Infineon. Uh, well, in fact, there, uh, I just mentioned uh, a few phones uh, like HTC iPhone, but uh, they are uh, sharing the market uh, across uh, various uh, models of phones. So, uh, well, this talk uh, mainly results from uh, an observation, uh, which, uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, the um, uh, hacking phones. It's something quite hard to reach uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, not a lot of people are actually, uh, not like on PC, uh, I mean, uh, are interested in, uh, in funds uh, because uh, it's hard to reach. It's a quite close industry. Uh, the phone, uh, I mean, uh, the, the phone manufacturers don't disclose, uh, don't disclose any specifications. Uh, they, <laughs> Uh, every uh, baseband model is proprietary. Uh, so on the system side, uh, you see kind of a black box running uh, uh, like a notifying uh, piece of code uh, handling uh, terrifying protocols. Well, if, in, if you're just interested in the network side, uh, well, you go to the 3GPP.com uh, 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 website and uh, then, uh, well, it's very discouraging. <laughs> To say the least. Uh, so there's multiple reasons to look into baselines. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the main reason would be to uh, to understand how a phone really works because uh, everybody uh, is using phone uh, nowadays, and uh, everybody uh, so has a baseband. And well, it would be kind of cool to know what's really running into your phone. Uh, Another reason would be for uh, vulnerability research, obviously, because uh, the code base is, uh, is very old, like uh, 20 years uh, or much. Uh, it's uh, very big. The network protocols are very complicated, so it has a good potential for finding vulnerabilities into, it, into them. And uh, also for uh, semen locking, for example. Uh, well, so there has been prior works on uh, baseband exploitation, for example. So uh, one of them uh, has been uh, presented last year at uh, 27C3 uh, by uh, Raph Philip uh, Weinman, uh, who reported vulnerabilities in uh, Infineon and uh, Qualcomm basebands. But there, there is no much detail actually on uh, what uh, is the uh, environment, the code environment of the baseband. Uh, and in this context, uh, I think exploitation is almost impossible. Uh, well, anyone uh, who has done a, a little bit of exploitation uh, knows 
uh, that you need to, to know at least uh, in which architecture you're running, uh, what is the operating system, the memory, uh, uh, where you can jump or not, uh, etc. So uh, in, this, uh, in this manner, uh, there is a clear lack of literature about uh, baseband, uh, uh, well, for example, last year there was uh, this presentation about uh, SMS ODEF where uh, they, have, they took all funds, uh, they deployed a, a nice uh, um, fuzzing uh, uh, architecture with uh, OpenBTS and uh, they began to, uh, to fudge the funds just to see the result. And as a matter of fact, uh, well, almost uh, all funds uh, has crashed or bricked, but uh, what that what, there was no really uh, exploitation uh, behind this because uh, people we were uh, who were uh, presenting uh, this talk uh, could not get the end uh, on the uh, on the system uh, of the funds. So uh, it's very interesting to know that you can uh, find vulnerab vulnerabilities in this manner, but if you can't uh, exploit them, you have to, uh, at the very best, to classify them as denial of service uh, while they may be exploitable. And so that's quite, uh, well. Uh, so uh, about this talk, uh, I will be presenting uh, what I've done on a USB 3G stick, uh, which is a quite common, uh, common US 3G USB stick uh, you can find uh, on eBay or uh, from your uh, uh, phone operator. Uh, I will describe, uh, uh, so it's a Qualcomm baseband inside and I will describe the, the operating system running uh, behind this and how it's possible uh, to develop a debugger to, uh, to do live debugging on the baseband, which is quite necessary if you want to, uh, well, if you want to, to reverse the baseband and also find vulnerabilities. So, well, maybe I'll need my sticks, you know. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, uh, uh, so this is the stick, actually. Uh, in, uh, in France, you can uh, find this stick uh, with uh, France Telecom, uh, orange, sorry, uh, which is the, the main, uh, uh, well, the leading uh, oper uh, phone operator in France. Uh, I'm not sure this stick uh, is uh, actually working uh, on uh, American frequencies, uh, but there are uh, closed models. Uh, so, uh, well, it's, uh, the name is, uh, it's an option uh, stick. It's an Icon uh, 225. Uh, it's a 3G USB stick with a Qualcomm inside. The, mo the Qualcomm model is uh, MSM6280. Uh, uh, you can find inside uh, an ARM V5 uh, processor and uh, two proprietary DSPs for uh, processing the, um, the, uh, the audio uh, signal and uh, the, the, modem, uh, the modem data. So uh, it's not the, the newest uh, USB stick you'll find uh, in, a, uh, for example, uh, uh, on eBay or uh, in your... Uh, in a shop. Uh, it's dating back to uh, 2008. Uh, and uh, well, the, the kernel which is running inside it has quite evolved since this. Uh, as far as I know uh, and I, as I've seen now, uh, uh, well, Rex is, the, oper is a, the name of the kernel uh, in the baseband. And it's not, uh, now it's, um, it's an hybrid kernel which, it, which is coupled with uh, OKL4. OK which is a derivative, a proprietary derivative of uh, L4 Pistachio. So, uh, well, if you plug a new USB stick uh, on your computer, what happens? Well, basically, uh, you have uh, this uh, emulated serial um, port over USB, which allows you to talk to the, uh, to the stick and uh, passing uh, 80 uh, commands. Uh, so like, for example, uh, 80 plus CPN, uh, equals uh, one, two, three, four to uh, unlock uh, the same. Uh, and uh, well, the stick is only supposed to uh, carry uh, data, packet data over 3G. Uh, 
in fact, uh, it's only supposed to do this, but uh, the manufacturer has just took, uh, uh, has just taken the, the baseband of a full-blown uh, phone and put it into a USB stick. So when you look inside it, uh, it can also do uh, circuit switch uh, operations, which means uh, voice and, uh, and such thing. Uh, the only difference with a phone is that obviously you have uh, no screen, uh, no speakers, and no microphone, uh, and no GPS and such things. Uh, well, uh, if you plug the, this USB stick uh, in your computer, you will see, uh, in fact, uh, three serial ports uh, firing up. Uh, the first one is used to pass 80 commands uh, to the modem um, and also packet data if the, the serial port is multiplexed. Uh, the second port is uh, only used for packet data uh, when the, uh, the ports are not, multi are not multiplexed. And the third port, which is interesting, is a channel to a Qualcomm diagnostic task. Um, which is uh, something which has been uh, left by Qualcomm engineers to, uh, to debug uh, the baseband. So uh, if in, how to enable the diagnostic channel, uh, it's very easy because in fact on this uh, model it's uh, directly accessible. You can directly pass uh, commands uh, to the diagnostic, diagnostic uh, mode. Uh, and on some phones, uh, I've seen you might need to send a strange AT command like uh, AT dollar QCDMG to activate uh, the, the diagnostic mode. So, uh, well, so it's a, it's a serial port, so you can pass uh, data into it, but there is a protocol, and the protocol is uh, fairly simple. It's, uh, it's not documented, obviously, because it's uh, an engineering protocol from Qualcomm. Uh, it has been partly reversed uh, in a modem manager, if you look into the source, is there is a directory named uh, libqcdm where, where you can find uh, part of the, of the protocol. So you have uh, begin and markers, uh, one byte indicating which is, uh, what is the command, and uh, variable parameters, like uh, depending on the command actually, and a CRC. Uh, so, um, there is a, a lot of comments uh, in this uh, diagnostic mode. Uh, and actually, some of them offer direct access to the baseband memory. So for example, the, the second command uh, reads a byte uh, in memory, and the command five uh, writes a byte in memory. But there are like uh, hundreds of comments. Uh, so from this, it's directly possible to uh, byte by byte uh, dump the bootloader uh, at uh, FFFFF uh, four zeros, which is uh, the entry point uh, uh, in ARM. And um, you can also uh, dump the whole system memory from zero because it's loaded, uh, it's loaded in memory. Uh, there is also a second mode, which is accessible from the diagnostic mode, uh, which is called uh, the downloader mode. Uh, it's, um, it's a mode. Uh, which is uh, specifically uh, designed to uh, uh, write a piece of code into memory and uh, execute it. Uh, when you enter this mode, uh, you have only two commands available, uh, write the data and execute uh, at address. You can only write in a, uh, in a hard coded the range of memory, which is quite small. And, uh, well, to, to get to this mode, uh, you have uh, to go through uh, the command uh, uh, 58 of the diagnostic mode. Uh, it's also enabled when the system crashes. And uh, on some HC, uh, HCC phones, like the uh, HCC Desire, Desire uh, Z, I think, uh, you have, uh, when you boot your phone, you can hold uh, volume up, volume down, and power during a few seconds in booting. You'll see five, vib five vibrations. If you plug uh, the USB stick, the USB cable, sorry, uh, on, uh, on the phone, you'll see a serial port, and this serial port offers the download mode. So you can, you can push uh, data and execute uh, in the baseband. It's uh, directly accessible, it's free. Uh, but uh, in fact, you do not really need this, since uh, you've got uh, unlimited read and write access uh, in memory with the diagnostic mode uh, already, 
But if you don't get this mode, you can try the download mode. So, uh, as I said, uh, you can dump uh, everything uh, in RAM in the baseband. So you've got some kind of a live memory snapshot of the memory, uh, which is nice. Uh, it's not actually a real uh, memory snapshot because each time you call uh, to read a single byte, uh, the task which is handling your request will have been scheduled uh, by the operating system. So uh, it, the image you get might not be totally coherent, but in practice it's uh, fairly uh, uh, efficient. And uh, what is nice is that you can also do this by uh, dumping, for, ex for example, a, a firmware upgrade and pass it into IDA Pro to, uh, to look inside the system. Uh, but, uh, but with uh, dumping the, the memory uh, of, uh, of the baseband, you also get access to the BSS section, which is uh, empty uh, in a firmware upgrade, obviously, so you get uh, access to the stacks. You have the backtrace uh, of the stacks, you have uh, the heap, you have uh, everything, any global variable in memory, which is uh, directly accessible with the, the right values uh, into them. So it's a, very, uh, it's a lot of information, actually, and it's very nice. Um, so the memory, uh, the memory snapshot is, uh, well, uh, 32 uh, megabytes long. You can find the entry point by uh, reversing the, the bootloader. Um, and, uh, well, it can be directly passed into IDA Pro. Uh, and, uh, well, from this point, you can also um, already uh, see so, some uh, system characteristics, uh, like uh, all tasks share the same address space. Uh, you can uh, quickly find uh, where is the page table uh, and see that the first 30, um, uh, it's 12, uh, I think it's 12 uh, megabytes of, uh, of uh, um, of memory or marked as a read-only. Uh, everything is running in uh, ARM supervisor mode and uh, it's uh, presumably compiled uh, with uh, RealView, which is the official ARM toolchain for compilation with no stack protection and uh, ARM v ARMv5 uh, does not support uh, CX and bytes, which is the, the same as uh, the NX bytes on x86. Uh, so, uh, I'll talk about the what I've seen uh, from this operating system, uh, and uh, especially the, the kernel, um, from this memory dump. So, uh, well, uh, Qualcomm uh, has developed its own uh, um, proprietary uh, real-time uh, kernel, uh, which is called REX, uh, standing for uh, real-time executive. The whole operating system, uh, which is, means uh, the kernel plus uh, the network stacks and uh, any process uh, is named uh, AMSS. And uh, well, the system is, um, you can see directly the system is made of uh, approximately 70 tasks uh, running concurrently uh, in the baseband. <coughs> so you have multiple, uh, each, task, each task has uh, a different purpose. Is there are some tasks for uh, handling the, the hardware uh, like the USB, the USIM, the DSPs, and so on. And uh, you've got also uh, one task for each protocol stack at each layer, so the, such as uh, L1, L2, or RMM, uh, for the WCDMA, uh, and so on. So uh, if you want to, um, in fact, it's a, it's, it's a tiny kernel, but uh, the, the main, uh, the biggest part of the operating system are the network stacks which are very, very massive. Uh, but if you want to, to reverse some tasks uh, randomly, for example, I want to reverse uh, GSM L1, uh, you'll need to know uh, what is the uh, API exported by the kernel so you have a minimum understanding of what the code is doing. Uh, so you need to, well, at least reverse the kernel API, uh, the, C, the C library also, and uh, some uh, built-ins, uh, some compiler built-ins like subplot. Uh, or 64 uh, long uh, arithmetic operations. So, uh, well, at first, uh, how the system is booting? So, well, uh, you've got uh, a primary bootloader which is stored in, in ROM, uh, which, uh, which is immutable, uh, which uh, will read from NAND 
uh, Qualcomm secondary bootloader named the QCSBL. Uh, this uh, this SBL is supposed to, to load uh, another SBL named the uh, OEM SBL, which means uh, the manufacturer of the phone can implement their own bootloader. So, such as, for example, uh, on HCC phones, you've, you've got HBoot, HBoot, sorry, which is uh, the OEM SBL. So you have a menu, a, sp uh, a splash screen, and so on. And then uh, it loads uh, the AMSS operating system, which is what is re really running uh, uh, in the baseband uh, in the end. Um, and uh, between it, each of these transitions, uh, uh, the, uh, you can have uh, cryptographic signatures for each of the layers. Uh, on this uh, particular, uh, on this specific model of a USB stick, you have no OEM SBL. Uh, so QCSBL is directly uh, loading AMSS, and um, there is no uh, secure boot at all. So uh, there is no signature. You can reflash actually uh, the, uh, the stick and run your own uh, your own baseband, uh, your own operating system if you like. Uh, you you've got to to write the, to write it. But uh, well, for example, uh, it's. It could be possible to run uh, a smoke on BB on this. Uh, well, so uh, the Rex tasks. Um, so you've got, uh, as I said, you've got a lot of tasks, like uh, 70. Uh, I'm just uh, talking here about the, the core tasks uh, of the operating system. Well, you've got the SIP task, which is uh, the idle task, doing nothing. Um, DPC task is uh, used. I explain later what is uh, APCs. Uh, in the in the Rex uh, world, uh, it's just dispatching uh, APCs across tasks. Uh, the main task uh, is the first task uh, loaded, the first task created. It uh, creates all the system tasks and then under uh, the timer events. Uh, there is also a task uh, which is uh, used to verify that uh, critical tasks in the system are still alive, uh, a watchdog. And well, you've got a uh, data service task uh, gathering uh, any information from, uh, from each protocol layers and uh, uh, passes, them, passes them through pipes uh, to create socket and so on. You've got a task uh, dedicated to call management, so to for secret, uh, secret switch uh, uh, processing and uh, packet switch uh, processing to implementing uh, TCP IP, for example. Uh, so, uh, the kernel, so it's a real-time uh, kernel. Uh, the scheduler, uh, well, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, well, you've got, um, uh, actually, uh, each, uh, every, um, um, all tasks run in the same, um, in the same address space, address space and in the same uh, uh, state the same mode of ARM, which is a supervisor. So you do not need uh, some complex uh, processing to do task switch. Uh, you just save the context, the context of, the uh, of a task on the stack, and you change uh, the stack pointer, and you can, uh, you can by, this, uh, by this process, uh, switching tasks uh, very, uh, very quickly. Uh, there are also, uh, well, there, there are a lot of fields. I'm just putting the main fields here. The real, uh, each task has a, a signal, a set of signals which can be uh, fired or, uh, or cleared. Uh, a task can wait for some signals uh, to, uh, uh, well, it waits for signals and another task will send a signal to, for the task to resume. Uh, and the tasks are also, uh, of course, uh, ordered by a priority. So, um, well, uh, as I said, the context switch is, uh, is very easy. Uh, the scheduler also uh, supports uh, critical sections. Um, so uh, the kernel also um, supports uh, APC, DPC mechanisms. Uh, I'm not taking this, uh, this terminology from the Windows world. It's really called like this uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the strings of the kernel. Uh, so, um, well, Basically, it works in the same way as Windows. Uh, an asynchronous uh, procedure call is just uh, pushing a, a new context uh, on the stack of a stack, 
uh, on the stack of a task and uh, uh, when the task is resuming, uh, because it was in a wait state, for example, it will uh, um, execute uh, the call and then uh, resume to its uh, original execution. So uh, you've got a task which is dedicated to uh, APCs, which is a DPC task with a high priority, and uh, it, it allows a task to execute some code in the context of another task. The operating system also uh, handles timers, of course, because it's a real-time uh, operating system. Uh, so, well, uh, you can set a specific action to occur at regular intervals. It's very used in the kernel uh, because, uh, well, uh, in uh, the RF world, you have to do some processing at uh, various intervals. Uh, so, uh, timers are only by the main task. By the main task, sorry. When it has uh, processed uh, the creation of uh, all the tasks, it's uh, entering a loop, uh, checking for timers to, uh, to fire. Uh, when a, a timer uh, is triggered, you can, uh, well, whatever, uh, send a signal to a task. For example, a signal can, it, it's just like an event, uh, you see. A task can wait for a signal, and then another task can send a signal to another task. So it's like an event. You can trigger an event to a task. You can execute an APC. So, uh, and you can also uh, execute a direct call, which will be uh, directly, uh, uh, directly uh, processed in the context, uh, in the context uh, of the main task. So uh, tasks, of course, there are, there are 70 tasks running in the baseband, each for one uh, protocol layer. So uh, there have some be some communications between all those tasks. Uh, so the so kernel EPC, IPCs uh, and, uh, are uh, fairly uh, simple. Also, uh, well, the, the main uh, mean of uh, the main uh, uh, method to uh, to communicate between tasks is uh, the use of signals. Like for example, a task uh, will have a, a queue. Uh, shared between two tasks, uh, it will push some data and send a signal for the task uh, to, to fetch the data. And then the other task can send a signal to say, hey, hey I've acknowledged uh, the data, I've got it, uh, I, can pop the, I can pop the stack. Um, the real results, um, the DS task, so the DS task is a data service task, it's, um, it's used to uh, to, uh, to unify uh, all the, um, the gathering uh, of uh, protocol stacks at the lower layers. Uh, it will fetch uh, all the data and uh, put them into pipes so that you can see uh, the, the data as a continuous uh, stream of data, like a network flow. Uh, so it's uh, very widely used uh, all across the baseband, uh, all across the system. Uh, uh, I've, I've n I'm not sure, but I think this is uh, also used for uh, the implementation uh, of sockets on uh, packet uh, switch uh, services. Um, well, the memory management, uh, well, you've got uh, uh, a heap, of course. Uh, heaps, is, is, um, there is a, a global heap in the system uh, but it, actually, I don't really know why it's not very used. Uh, in fact, each uh, task implements their own heap. Uh, they reuse the same code, of course, but uh, they have separate heaps at a fixed address, uh, hard-coded address in the code. Uh, so the, the heap structure is uh, very simple. Uh, well, the heap metadata uh, uh, will just keep track of so what is the first block, what is the last block, and for each, uh, each uh, chunk block, you will see uh, what is uh, the size of the, of the data and uh, is the block free or not. So the next block is just uh, the block uh, after uh, my block plus uh, the size. Uh, there is no defragmentation process involved uh, or complex things. Uh, it's uh, very quick uh, and efficient. Uh, well, and well, that's all. <laughs> so. Um, the, the nice thing, uh, 
that you want to do is to uh, debug the baseband. Because, uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, for example, this is just a, um, a quick overview of, uh, of the kernel, of, uh, of the system. Uh, and the system is made of uh, a lot of tasks. Um, you can uh, take uh, an image of the firmware, uh, of the baseband, and uh, statically uh, reverse each task one by one if you want. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the code is very, very dense, like uh, or, uh, horrible, uh, and um, uh, uh, the main problem, too, is that a lot of interactions are involved at, rent at runtime between uh, every task. So uh, if you try to, to look into the baseband, you will, you will see for a task uh, big switches uh, for uh, the handling of signals, uh, sending signals to other tasks and so on. And if you just look at, look at it statically, it's uh, almost uh, impossible to understand uh, what's really happening uh, uh, in the baseband. Uh, so you, you have to, to, to get uh, some, uh, to see the system running uh, in live at runtime and uh, eventually uh, you would want to be able to uh, catch interruptions for example if you you be you you are able to trigger uh, an overflow or something and uh, you want to uh, single step a task and uh, follow the, the control flow and so on uh, so uh, how it's possible well for a Code execution, getting code execution on the baseband, uh, given what, I, what I've told before uh, about um, uh, the uh, diagnostic mode, is very easy, uh, obviously, because you have uh, arbitrary uh, read and writes in RAM. So, well, you code execution is uh, is given. It's free. Uh, well, you you want to uh, upload your code but you also want to communicate with your code uh, easily. So the two main ideas would be to either to hook an IT command or either uh, to hook a diagnostic command. Uh, I prefer to, uh, to hook a diagnostic command in my case because it allows me to debug the IT command. Uh, well, if my debugger is running in the context of the diagnostic task, I cannot debug the diagnostic task, uh, obviously. So if I inject it in the IT command handler, it's the same thing. Um, well, I could uh, eventually, uh, well, uh, optionally, I could create another task in the system and, uh, and be able to debug, uh, to debug every task, but uh, it's, it's not very important because the diagnostic task it is not a critical task in the system. Um, so uh, I'm basically just reusing the, the, the future of, uh, of the diagnostic task and using its own API, API uh, to, uh, to communicate with the payload uh, over USB on the emulated serial port. Uh, it's, uh, it's possible to quickly get a code execution because uh, actually only the first uh, 12 megabytes of, of memory are uh, marked as read-only uh, by in the, uh, in the page table, but um, the, the, code, um, the code section of the, of the binary is uh, 16 megabytes uh, long. So there are like uh, four megabytes which are writable. And uh, luckily, uh, the diagnostic loop uh, and link commands is in this, uh, in this range. So you can uh, just uh, rewrite uh, the command table pointer, uh, duplicate uh, the command table uh, pointer uh, elsewhere, and uh, get code execution through this just uh, hooking a, a command. So it's, uh, it's very easy. Uh, well, it, when you, you get code execution, if you want to write a debugger, next you want to, uh, to be able to break a task. Uh, for, uh, well, a task should be stopped if you instruct it to do so. Uh, the debugger tells uh, stop this task, or uh, if you hit an, uh, an exception or, or a breakpoint. So, um, you have to be able to be to unschedule uh, a task and uh, resume it uh, on demand. Uh, for this, uh, I just uh, reuse uh, the kernel API I've, re I've uh, reversed before. So there is a specific function for uh, waiting for a signal uh, for a task. So um, 
I'm just uh, using, uh, well, I'm just telling a task to wait for this signal and the debugger can resume the task by sending the signal to the, to the task. Uh, he, there is a need that the signal uh, is not used uh, in the system in normal conditions. Otherwise, uh, you would wake up the task uh, uh, even before you, you would have told, told it to. So, um, uh, what is done is that I, uh, uh, I have to execute this piece of code in the context of the task. So uh, I could uh, patch uh, the, the code of the task and redirect the control flow, but the kernel directly offers an API to, uh, to uh, execute code in the context of another task with a DPC. So uh, I create a DPC uh, and send, uh, send it to the task and tell the debugger, uh, uh, wait, uh, tell the task, uh, wait for this signal. So, um, well, um, if you want to, uh, I, I don't know if anybody in this room has uh, any uh, developed a, a debugger for ARM, I mean a, a software debugger, but uh, in fact it's quite horrible because uh, ARM uh, has no native support for single step. It's quite crazy uh, because uh, if you want to, uh, well, do something as simple as single stepping a, a thread, uh, it's uh, you have, well, the first way to do it, it's not like an x86 where you have the trap flag and uh, you will trigger uh, an interrupt uh, at each uh, instruction. There is no mechanism in ARM for this, so the standard way to do this is to predict the next, uh, the next pointer uh, of the, the next value of the PC uh, register, set a BP in memory, and resume the, the thread. So, uh, there is an obvious problem uh, in this situation is that uh, if you are in a multi-thread context, like uh, here, uh, you can't do this in a safe way uh, because uh, between the time when you put the breakpoint and the time when you order the task or the thread to continue, another task could have hit, uh, hit the breakpoint. So it would have to check if uh, the breakpoint was meant uh, to uh, for this task, uh, so it can be done. But uh, for example, if you uh, if you single step into mem copy, uh, in, uh, it will be it will trigger uh, thousands of uh, interrupts uh, per second. And, uh, well, you don't want this; it's it's not reliable. So another way would be, of course, to uh, you have the the context uh, of the thread, you emulate the instruction and you uh, update the context of the thread. Well, uh, you need uh, an emulator for this. Uh, the solution which is offered by uh, GDB in a multi-thread context is uh, to use uh, displaced uh, breakpoints. So uh, it will use a scratch buffer where it will copy the instruction. Uh, it will put a breakpoint after the instruction, set PC uh, on the scratch buffer, and resume the execution. In this way, you do not put the breakpoint in memory uh, where the code is really relying, and so the other task can uh, continue to execute without triggering uh, exceptions. Um, in fact, uh, well, at first, memory, uh, GDB does not support some for this, so uh, you have to record it. And uh, also, uh, you have to, in ARM, you can address PC, so uh, you have to, uh, to take care of uh, instruction reloc relocations uh, like uh, loading a value from PC or uh, using, uh, if, you do, if this is a jump, for example, you would uh, jump out of the buffer and the breakpoint will never have been hit, so you have to account for this, uh, for this uh, scenario too. And uh, well, it's quite painful to implement. If you want something which uh, supports ARM and some, it's, uh, um, you can also, uh, another solution will be to virtualize the address space for uh, each task. Uh, in this way, you just uh, put a breakpoint, use copy, uh, copy and write and, uh, uh, for the page where you put the breakpoint. And in this way, uh, over tasks are uh, safe for execution. Uh, but for this, you need to patch the scheduler and uh, implement patch tables for, uh, for each task. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite painful too. So, well, my solution for, for the moment is to use a displaced breakpoint uh, and standard too. Uh, 
So uh, what is uh, the debugger architecture? Uh, so, uh, well, you've got um, the, the stick, uh, you've got GDB. Uh, I try to be uh, GDB uh, compliant. Um, you are communicating over the diagnostic protocol. So, well, you need some kind of a proxy to, uh, to, uh, to put the GDB request into your protocol. And, uh, well, you can also uh, show each task of uh, the operating system as a thread in GDB. So this way you can, uh, you can reuse the multi-threading uh, features of GDB uh, to debug the baseband. Uh, so I think I do a demo of, uh, of the debugger. Uh, so uh, wait a second. Okay. Um, Just checking. All right. Uh, so uh, at first, um, well, I'm uh, I'm using the um, the, uh, the diagnostic mode to uh, push uh, my debugger into the baseband memory uh, and uh, as I said before, uh, rewriting a pointer to, uh, to get uh, uh, access and code execution. So, well, here it loads the thing. It will be finished soon here. Uh, so, uh, I'm uh, running the proxy. Okay, so the proxy is ready, so we can communicate uh, with the, uh, the debugger inside the stick. Now I've got a, a cross-compiled GDB for ARM, and I'm just uh, connecting the proxy and the GDB uh, and the GDB client. And here it should work. Okay. So, uh, well, when GDB uh, is uh, connecting uh, to the proxy, it will ask for the list of uh, threads uh, on the target. So here, uh, GDB is uh, seeing uh, the baseband task of the operating system. So, uh, well, uh, you can see the name of the task. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, you, you have the DPC task, the doc task, you have a... Uh, a lot of tasks which are dedicated to uh, network protocols at uh, various layers. Uh, you've got the main tasks, uh, some uh, hardware tasks like DSP, uh, the vocoder, uh, well, the uh, CNV RAM, uh, and, and so on. So, uh, okay. So, um, when you uh, debug uh, the baseband, actually, uh, you have, uh, as I said before, you have a, a watchdog task, which is uh, constantly uh, checking whether uh, tasks uh, are alive. So uh, if you break a task, uh, if, for example, with a breakpoint or something, the watch point, the watchdog, sorry, will uh, detect it and uh, reboot the system. So uh, you have uh, first to, uh, to account for this and, uh, and uh, break the, the so the doc task. So I'm going to. Uh, okay, so here I'm uh, getting into the context of the task and uh, interrupting. Okay, so the task is uh, interrupted. Uh, I can check its uh, registers. Uh, I can check uh, well, its uh, well, its code and so on. Um, you can uh, also, uh, well, indirectly uh, inspect uh, any, anything uh, in the baseband memory, obviously. So, for example, if I call uh, uh, Rex uh, self, sorry, oh. which is the, um, uh, the API in the kernel to get the, the current task, the current task structure. So, here I'm calling it. So. Okay, I get uh, this. No, I'm printing it. Uh, okay, 
So uh, as you can see, uh, well, if you uh, you can uh, inspect, uh, you can do the same thing for for the heap. For example, uh, my debugger has a separate heap, so you can uh, you can inspect the structures very easily. Here you can see that uh, I'm really calling uh, this uh, function in the context of the of the doc task. You have the name uh, uh, in the field uh, directly in the task structure. So. Uh, now, uh, for uh, breakpoints and uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, just a second. Uh, for example, I will. Uh, okay. So, here is just uh, an AT command handler for um, the SGSN uh, AT uh, command. Uh, it's just a command, uh, an AT command to get uh, the uh, the email or of the of the phone and the serial number of the manufacturer of the of the mobile. So, um, well, just uh, putting a breakpoint on it. Uh, I don't see my screen on my computer. It's kind of. <laughs> okay. Here I mean the IET channel. IET plus AGSN. No? Not CGSN? What? Okay. So here I've hit uh, the breakpoint. Uh, if you look at uh, the task, you can see which task, uh, in which context uh, I am. It's quite slow because uh, GDB is doing a lot of uh, useless stuff. Uh, uh, well, here it's uh, in the data service task, which is handling the AT commands. Uh, so I'm getting into its context. Okay get access to its registers, I can check its per <laughs> parameters. Uh, I can see, uh, as you can see, this is uh, the right task and uh, well, I can uh, single step uh, into it. Okay. Um, well, it's uh, also nice for catching ex exceptions. So, uh, well, going back to uh, uh, to this, uh, well, I'll get back. I, I like to use uh, the watchdog task for my experimentations because uh, when it dies, uh, nobody cares. <laughs> uh, so, just uh, calling, for example, a function. Uh, which happens, uh, which happens to have uh, another uh, stack overflow, an obvious stack overflow into it. So, well, just a name copy on the stack. Uh, here. Okay, and here you get this. Uh, so, yeah, you can see uh, that uh, you have uh, rewritten EIP and get a backtrace. Uh, well, the backtrace may not be accurate uh, anyway in GDB because it has no way to uh, to distinguish between uh, code and data. So uh, I'm guess, uh, I suppose it uses uh, heuristics uh, to to find this. Uh, well, so if you find uh, well, if you use uh, this uh, this thing, so uh, this debugger, and uh, you fill the the USB key, you can catch uh, interruptions and uh, see uh, the context, uh, the task in which you are. Uh, um, in which you are uh, triggering the, uh, the exception. Um, yeah, and uh, there is also a nice possibility uh, with uh, this uh, with this way because um, this way of doing because uh, when you get a code execution on, a, on the stack, uh, well, uh, on the stack uh, code execution on the base one, uh, you. Um, you can also uh, directly pass command to the baseband, and so you can, uh, instead of deploying uh, a huge, uh, well, not a huge, but uh, 
like deploying a BTS and uh, doing a radio frequency fusing uh, on, uh, on the baseband, you can uh, uh, inject data locally uh, on the USB key. Uh, so uh, possibly, uh, well, it could be possible to fuse uh, the baseband uh, with no BTS at all. Just uh, passing commands to the, to the debugger and tra transferring, uh, making the right uh, function calls. Uh, well, you need to know which function you want to, to fuse, uh, of course. Uh, so. Okay, so in uh, as conclusion, uh, well, uh, baseband systems are uh, still massively used and uh, poorly known. Uh, there is no much literature uh, nowadays for, uh, for uh, seeing uh, how is uh, architectured uh, a baseband uh, operating system. Uh, the nice thing about the ICON uh, 2.5 is that um, uh, it uses a non-secure bootloader, uh, so uh, you can easily uh, reflash it if you know what you're doing. Um, there is also um, uh, uh, easy uh, code execution uh, achievable, so uh, it's nice for uh, reverse engineering. Uh, but you have to know that the more recent versions on, uh, on phones today use an OKL4 uh, Rex hybrid kernel, so it's not exactly uh, the same thing. Uh, as far as I've seen, uh, the uh, L4 kernel is just used for the scheduling, but uh, the Rex kernel remains for uh, everything else. Uh, well, uh, in the, of course, uh, on, uh, on smartphones today, you have a, a second uh, processor with uh, interactions with, uh, with the application processor. So, uh, well, uh, well, you can see some related tools, the Rai Philip Vaman uh, Baseband Apocalypse uh, last year, uh, Luis Muras talking about uh, Baseband Playground on uh, Infineon uh, Unlocking. And, uh, well, on the web, you have uh, various communities. So you have uh, TGWorld, BB, uh, BB uh, BB.osmocom.org for Osmocom BB, uh, and um, many communities like uh, XDA developers and, uh, and so on. Interesting. Uh, Okay, so thank you for your attention. Yeah. So, thank you for your talk. I just want uh, to uh, ask you to uh, please sit down until the questions also are done. And if you leave, please leave through the front door and uh, take your trash with you. So, questions. Here in front. So, thank you for your talk. And a question regarding the base. Um, have you seen JTAG lines or something? So, for example, if you try to um, mess around with the flash, you need, a, need, need an emergency exit. So you can, for example, uh, re rewrite the flash with a JTAG debugger. So if you, for example, have a, a costly um, a commercial JTAG uh, debugger that can use the ARM uh, device, so you can always reflash the, um, the device. So if you, if you mess around with the flash, you, are, you have a brick device. Yeah, um, you mean uh, through JTAG or? Yeah, yeah. Have, have, uh, have, you see, have you seen some JTAG lines, or have you looked for this? Uh, I have not looked for this. I know there is a JTAG which is uh, connected for, uh, directly to the uh, ARM processor, but uh, to the flash, I don't know. I, I have not uh, looked into it. Okay, because it would be interesting to do this. But uh, you can uh, you can reflash the the, um, uh, the NAND through software calls, so you do not need the. Uh, not the word. Yeah, but for, for example, you can hook up debuggers like uh, from Lauterbach or other companies who make boot debuggers, and then you can just debug via JTAG. Yeah. You can you can just debug the device via JTAG. It's a normal way to debug a device. Yeah. Do you have, have a, a trace cell that is uh, connected to, to JTAG inside the chip, and then you can debug with a JTAG debugger. Okay. Well, and, uh, and so you, if, if, you, if you messed up everything, you can, can just write yeah, the, the just flash write. again. Yeah. yeah. But I, uh, I don't know, honestly. <laughs> I have not uh, looked for it. I have not tried to, uh, to reflash the device for the moment. I, I'm just, uh, as you saw, I'm just uh, pushing the code uh, in the RAM uh, at runtime. Yeah. Uh, I've got two questions via IRC. The first one is, uh, is the baseband you analyzed identical to the embedded basebands of Qualcomm's MSM 7000 or Snapdragon chipsets? Uh, are they? Sorry? Uh, whether the baseband, the baseband you analyzed, yeah. is identical to the, base, the embedded basebands in the Qualcomm MSM 7000 chips or Snapdragon 7, chips? 
Uh, no, uh, I think in uh, 7000 you, you have a, a Rix uh, L4 hybrid kernel, so it's not exactly the same thing. But, and then, uh, uh, the system is, uh, you know, they have not uh, rewritten the, the system from scratch. They have just uh, changed uh, the kernel, uh, but uh, well, I think if you find, on, I don't know, but if you find a vulnerability, uh, for example, on this stick, there is some uh, some fair chances to find, uh, to find it in, uh, uh, in other versions, whether or not the kernel is different. Okay. Uh, someone is asking how long did the whole process of reverse engineering this take? Uh, this, uh, honestly, uh, uh, maybe uh, for reversing just the kernel, uh, maybe uh, le uh, five days, maybe. Uh, but uh, just uh, well, uh, st gluing all the things together and uh, uh, testing, developing the thing, uh, two months. Two okay. Months. Uh, and could you please put your slides and the URLs on the pentabarf? Yeah. That would be cool. Thanks. <laughs> Did you have access to any um, documentation, any, any papers of Qualcomm? So, like uh, user manuals for for Rex or something. Uh, like there is, uh, I, uh, I know there is some um, some leaked uh, documents from Qualcomm uh, on the internet. Uh, well, uh, I've looked uh, into them, uh, but uh, well, uh, the thing is, uh, something interesting is that you have the the Rex sources, which has been leaked for a very old version of Rex, uh, but from uh, what I've seen, the uh, well. What is in this USB stick is much more complicated than uh, what I saw uh, in the sources. So um, it's uh, uh, it's looking alike, but not the same thing. And it's uh, in the baseband uh, documents. Uh, there are a lot of leaked documents, but uh, I have not uh, go through uh, all of them. So it's uh, it's good to um, check on them to see if you are on the right path, but not. Uh, Um, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, the agenda was to find out uh, interesting things about the Qualcomm baseband. So I'm wondering why you are not using the Qualcomm diagnostics tools that are more or less freely available on the internet, which seem to have leaked from Qualcomm licensees. So your work is somewhat different and it's impressive, but why not try this first? So, and the second question is, um, are you doing this privately for fun, or are you doing this uh, uh, through your company with some agenda? Uh, no, I'm uh, working for a company. I'm working at uh, Sujeti, yeah. uh, which is a French uh, French company. And uh, but that doesn't mean I, don't, I, I do not work for fun. I mean, uh, I'm doing it for fun I also. Uh, but uh, uh, the very, uh, in fact, uh, the, the first idea I had uh, when I started uh, looking into into this was not to uh, find vulnerabilities or uh, developing a debugger, but uh, developing uh, more of uh, something to dump the data, like uh, uh, so at various network uh, layers, just to see uh, uh, without uh, deploying uh, BTS and something, uh, just to see what uh, the network data would look like uh, in telephony protocols. So I find this interesting to, to be able to dump uh, data on this key. But uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, I realized that for reverse engineering, I needed a debugger, so I first developed a debugger. Uh, and you, is, well, there was two questions, but uh, the first one was... <laughs> well, why not use the, the tools that are available on the internet, like QCM or so? You can find this in several places. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Which attach to the diagnostics port you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, what is available on the internet, sorry. Uh, maybe there is something I haven't seen, or so. Yeah. If, if you Google it, you'll find it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you mean the diagnostic uh, channel, for example? Or everything no, uh, no, about No, 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 the tool for it, which is called QXDM. Uh, well, maybe, I'll, okay. It's not very long to reverse, actually. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, we noticed some symbol names in your uh, in the GDB output. Are those your symbol names, or did you find a symbol table within the uh, binary? Uh, actually, I'm uh, in my GDB. 
in this script, uh, uh, I'm uh, just uh, loading, uh, uh, well, uh, my, uh, my, my debugger, I include uh, the symbols into the, b the binary of my debugger in ELF, and I load it into GDB, so he can, uh, he can look into them. Okay, so those are your symbol names, though, not, uh, not official ones. No, no okay. it's my one. Thanks. So, are there any other questions here? Oh, oh, there are some. There are two. I see. Another question from IRC: Do you plan to release the source code, or is there a possibility to get to source uh, of your tools? Yeah, I have not uh, done it yet. Uh, I will uh, upload it to Google Code uh, as I did. <laughs> I, I think you hinted it at. Are you actually working on a protocol analyzer? Is that what you're actually building? Sorry. Uh, you, you sort of hinted at it but didn't actually say, were you actually working on a protocol analyzer? It, was that the, the sort of initial starting point? Uh, yeah, actually it was. <laughs> did, did you have any success in that or is that something you're still sort of working um, on? Uh, in fact, uh, for this, uh, well, um, I'm uh, just, uh, the debugger is not finished. For, uh, it's, uh, well, it has basic uh, debugging capabilities for the moment, but uh, there is uh, a future I need for, for this. It's uh, the implementation of a trace points. So uh, the ability to uh, not um, to resume a task uh, immediately after hitting a breakpoint. Uh, and for this, uh, well, it's not very, uh, Evident because um, you have uh, to uh, displace uh, the instruction, uh, well, uh, and uh, execute it elsewhere. So you have to perform relocations and so on. And my relocating uh, motor is uh, engine is not uh, is not completely uh, finished yet. So uh, as soon as I get a trace points working, I will put a trace points on uh, sockets in uh, the base ones, and uh, well, I will uh, try to see what comes uh, out of it. Yeah. So, thank you, Jan. We are now at the end of our time, and it was a very interesting talk, and have a wonderful applause.